There is a name Reigns without contention His power can't be questioned or contained With humble faith He rules the earth and heaven His glory knows no measure or refrain He's bursting past the borderlands of space Thronged upon the praises of our hearts Jesus, you're the King and you're the center of it all Of it all Hello and welcome to our online service for Sunday the 7th of March If you're joining us for the first time my name is Peter Bovell and I'm the minister of our church family here in Isle McGee. At the beginning of March, and as we edge closer to Easter, we're beginning a new series today. And as a church family, we are joining Peter, one of Jesus' disciples on his journey towards the cross and a journey of discovery of exactly who King Jesus was and what he came to do. Today, we are looking together at some verses from Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 21. But just before Esther reads them to us, we want to think about how good our eyesight is. Boys and girls, I hope that you have had a good week and it's great that you're with us online today. I wonder how many of you wear glasses or have had the experience of wearing glasses. If you're like me, your eyesight isn't perfect and wearing glasses really helps us see. However, if your eyesight is already perfect, then when you put on a pair of glasses, it makes your eyesight all fuzzy. And maybe you've experienced that as well. It was when I was in primary school that I first discovered that my eyesight wasn't perfect. And I was given some eyesight tests and one of the sets of eyesight tests is that you have to try and see the different numbers in the pictures. And I quickly discovered that I have some level of colour blindness. Now we're going to have a quick quiz. There are going to be five numbers popping up just for a few seconds. And I want you to see if you can work out what the different numbers are. Now, I am sure that you will have done better than I would have done. Now, Esther is going to read some verses to us from the Gospel of Matthew that record a discussion between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus is asking a question. He asks it of the crowds around. Who do people say I am? And then he asks the disciples the same question. And I want you to listen in and hear, did the crowds get it right? Did they see who Jesus really was? And secondly, did Peter get it right? Did he see clearly who Jesus really was? When Jesus came to the region of Caressa, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Wherever you forbid on earth will be forbi forbidden in heaven, and what, wherever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. We have just heard that the crowds didn't get it right. They didn't see who Jesus really was. They thought that he was Elijah or maybe one of the other prophets. 
However, Peter did get it right. As he watched Jesus' life, as he listened to all that Jesus said, he could see that Jesus was someone very special. That Jesus was the Son of God, God's special King. Now I wonder who you think Jesus is. Was he just a wise man or a miracle worker? Or as Peter says, do you see that Jesus is God's special King and the Son of God? Someone we should follow, someone we should give our lives to because he died for us and rescued us. Now later on in our service, in the next verses, we'll be seeing how Peter didn't see everything clearly. Yes, he realised that Jesus was God's special king, but he didn't realise that King Jesus was going to die on a cross. When Jesus started to tell his disciples about what was going to happen, and how he was going to suffer and die, Peter took Jesus aside and he told Jesus off. He said, this is never going to happen to you. But it was going to happen because Jesus was a different type of king to what Peter thought. Peter probably thought that King Jesus was going to get a crown, that he was going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem that he was going to fight with the Romans and kick them out of the country. Instead, King Jesus was going to suffer and die on a cross and then rise again three days later. And it's really important that we see clearly that Jesus is a king who had to die. Peter couldn't see that Jesus had to die in order to save us so that we could be friends with God. Peter couldn't see this in these verses, but in time he did see it and would spend the rest of his life telling the world about the king who died to save. Now, no matter what age we are, we can be praying that God would help us see who Jesus is more clearly. That he is the king, that he is the ruler over everything, that Jesus is the promised one, the son of God. In the verses that Esther read to us, you may have noticed these words of Jesus. You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. As we continue to worship together, we want to be mindful 
of the work of God's Spirit in revealing to us the truth of God's Word. It is God who reveals to us the true identity of Jesus and helps us to see clearly that Jesus is God's promised King and Rescuer. And so today, as we come to sing God's praise, as we hear from God through his word, as we take time to apply the, God's word, his truth, into our lives, as we pause to pray for ourselves and others, well, it is God who opens our eyes to see, to know, to cherish, to gain strength from his word. In Psalm 119, verse 18, the psalmist writes this, which I hope might be our prayer through our service today. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Let me pray for us before we sing what might be a, a new song for you. We have used it before in our online services in the last lockdown. But I hope that over these next number of weeks before Easter, we might learn it together as it speaks of our Saviour Jesus. It's called Him of the Saviour. But before we sing, let me pray for us. Let us pray. From Ephesians 1, I pray, God of Jesus Christ, give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ, so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened. Help us to know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, and the immeasurable greatness of your power at work in us, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
Let us pray together. Father God, as we continue to worship you today, we acknowledge our need for you to come and bring light and life into our lives through Jesus. We want to praise you and thank you for the story of rescue that is painted in the words that we have just sung. A story that speaks of your love, your mercy and grace towards us in sending Jesus. Lord God, over these coming weeks as we journey through towards Easter, we pray that in contemplating the events of that very first Easter, that we would begin to grasp the magnitude of your love for us. That we would grasp its length, its width, its height, its depth. And this, that this would lead us to praise you with our tongues, to worship you with every aspect of our lives. That it would move us to our knees in repentance and lift us to serve you and to love others in your name and for your glory. Lord God, we pray that you would continue to, to do a work in each of our lives as we know a greater sense of unity with you through Jesus. A greater sense of unity with each other as your family. As we continue in worship today, we pray these words for ourselves and each other. Our Lord and our God, now as we hear your word today, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. These last weeks have brought shock and sadness to many families and many of us within our local community here in Isle McGee. In the midst of lockdown and restriction, each challenge or trial that we face, no matter what it is, is just harder to cope with, harder to find a way through. And as we look for strength and hope and peace, can I point you to the only one who promises to draw alongside, to hem us in, to walk with us and carry us through? Can I commend to you the God of the Bible? And maybe if you have your Bible with you, or maybe an app on your phone, why not turn to Psalm 61 as I read these words of the psalmist, words of King David, that today could be our words as we pray to God. O oh God, listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the towering rock of safety, for you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. Let me live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me an inheritance reserved for those who fear your name. Add many years to the life of the king. May his years span the generations. May he reign under God's protection forever. May your unfailing love and faithfulness watch over him. Then I will sing praises to your name forever as I fulfil my vows each day. Amen. Let's pray for others now. Fathers, we begin another month of lockdown and restriction. We are mindful of each other and ourselves and the impact that all these things are having. Father, we want to pray. Pray for the month ahead. Loving God, in this moment when we feel locked into a terrible set of circumstances, locked up in our homes, Locked down by fear and uncertainty. Help us to find freedom in faith. Healing in hope. Liberty in your love. In this time when tempers can get frayed in relationships. Give us the fruit of your spirit in our lives, our homes, our dealings with one another. We pray for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Be especially with those who feel most isolated and alone. Grant them a deep sense of your presence through long days and lonely hours. Bring comfort and calm, strength and support. Help us to appreciate simple pleasures in a fresh way. The blessing of home, the joy of loved ones, the view from our windows, the voice of a friend on the phone. And Father God, as we pray for others, we pray, Father, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we may see Jesus. And as we see Jesus more clearly, help us see everything else from his perspective. Help us to see people with eyes of grace. Father, help us to see the beauty, the dignity in your image and people much more clearly than we notice their brokenness and inconsistencies. Help us to see what you see in our spouse, our children and our friends. And Father, help us to see pain and suffering with eyes of grace. Help us to reach out in love and grace. Help us to speak words of encouragement and care. Help us to be faithful in prayer for those who need your touch today, who we name before you now. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. No, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul. God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great Thou art, how great Thou art, and when I think that God His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burdens gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sin my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, how great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come with
shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art. Today, I have just a couple of announcements before we turn to God's Word. This week, we continue to meet on Wednesday evenings through Lent to pray together. These past weeks have been really encouraging as we have met and caught up with each other and prayed together. You'd be really welcome to join us over Zoom at 7.30 on Wednesday evening. The details go out via email on the Wednesday afternoon. Please do get in touch if you want to sign up for that email. And it also includes prayer points that you can use yourself if you don't want to join us on Zoom. Can I say a big thank you to those who left items for the international meeting point after an appeal a number of weeks ago? I had the, the privilege during the week of driving a full carload of items up to Belfast and to hear and see of their current ministry. Because of lockdown and restriction, their usual means of ministry isn't possible. And so they have become a food bank that opens twice a week, serving some nearly 200 families every week with over 350 individual families on their records. Do pray for Keith Preston and his team as they serve others and pray that very quickly they would be able to resume their ministry of support and English lessons and studying the Bible with those who have come to live in Northern Ireland from some 25 different nations around the world. As I alluded to a little earlier, as a community over these past weeks, there have been a, a number of deaths that have touched many lives. Could I today ask you that you remember in your prayers those families touched by grief? And especially today, that you might remember the family of Alistair Jones, who passed away a week ago today. As a church family, we want to assure Gerald and Joan, his parents, along with Emma and Catherine and the whole family circle, of our sympathy and prayers at this time. As I mentioned earlier in our time together, over these next few weeks, as we approach Easter, we're gonna be looking at passages that speak of the Apostle Peter and his journey in discovering the true identity and mission of Jesus that we find highlighted through the events around the cross and the empty tomb. Today, 
We want to begin our series in Matthew 16. We've heard from Esther already and and now we're going to hear some verses that challenge us about our view of who Jesus is and what it means to follow a king who came to die. Over these last months, I have been discovering that as you get older, your eyesight begins to change after years of just being the same. And many of you have no doubt experienced this. I now can't read items close up with my glasses. I have to take them off. Seeing clearly isn't as easy as it once was. And in the verses that Michael is going to read to us from Matthew 16, we see how after Peter's earlier success in seeing who Jesus was, he still didn't see the full story. And as Jesus begins to explain what lies ahead, Peter doesn't understand. And in true Peter style rebukes the King of Kings. And so let's hear God's word to us and then consider how clearly we are seeing Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 21 and reading through to the end of the chapter. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. I was listening to the radio during the week. And John Supel, a BBC News editor, editor in North America, was being interviewed about his new book, Unprecedented. The conversation touched on the presidency of George H.W. Bush, who was a one-term American president from 1989 to 1993. And they spoke about how his presidency in recent years has been re-evaluated in a more positive way and seen maybe in a new light. George H.W. Bush was not one for the limelight. He didn't look for celebrity or recognition. His focus seemed to be on the politics of the day rather than the headlines of the newspapers. And this may have limited his popularity with the people of America when it came to re-election. But he did prove very successful in world politics surrounding the end of the Cold War and conflict in the Middle East and big trade nego negotiations. For many, George H.W. Bush didn't do things in the presidential way of other presidents who were quick to seek the limelight, to give the sound bites, to court the attention of the press. Now already in our time together, we have discovered that Jesus was not the king that Peter and many others expected him to be. There is to be no earthly throne or mighty victory over the Romans. At this juncture in Matthew, we begin to discover that the earthly reign and life of Jesus is going to be at odds. It's going to be out of step with the earthly expectations for a king. And as the disciples, with especially Peter in focus, begin to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, God's promised king. Then Jesus begins to show them the path that God's king must tread in order to bring victory and rescue. And as we read in 1 Corinthians 1, this truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do, well, it would be a stumbling block to Jews 
It would be folly to the Gentiles. But as we see in Jesus' rebuke of Peter, this understanding of Jesus as the king who will die and rise again is not something that we can just set aside or pass by or say, it isn't for me. As the verses continue in 1 Corinthians, they say this, But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The death of Jesus on a Roman cross might be a stumbling block or folly, but it was always God's way of rescue. As we see in the Old Testament in verses like Isaiah 53. And the cross is no surprise to Jesus as throughout the Gospels he predicts the way of suffering that he will follow. And this way of suffering may fly in the face of everything our society would see as wisdom and power. But it reveals to us how the way of following Jesus is at odds with the world around us. Does your view of Jesus include the reality that he came to die and rise again? How do you view the historical person of Jesus Christ? And maybe you're at the point of beginning to consider who Jesus is. Well, I want to encourage you maybe to read a book like Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. He's a journalist who sought to investigate the evidence for Jesus and in doing so came to know Jesus personally in his life. Or why not read through the Gospels that present the person of Jesus to us? What do we find there? Who does Jesus say He is. What does he do? And what does that say to us? I wonder, is it possible to resolve that Jesus was just a good teacher or maybe a good person? I don't think you can. I don't think Jesus' life and words, these words before us today, allow us to think this. The testimony of God's word is that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God, the one who suffered many terrible things at the hands of the elders and priests, who was killed and who rose again. It is this Jesus that we're called to turn to, to seek forgiveness through his death and to live for with all of our heart, our soul, our mind and strength each day that God gives us. My prayer today is that God would open the spiritual eyes of each and every one of us and reveal more and more of who Jesus is so that we might follow him more closely and love him more dearly. No matter who we are or at what stage in our spiritual lives we are at, we need the work of God's spirit to reveal to us the truth of his word to be able to see the world around us with his eyes as well. And it's through God's spirit that as we read in verse 23, we can set our minds on the things of God and not on the things of man. What an amazing thing to pray for in our lives. That as we open up his word, that we would very clearly see God's heart and mind. As we face decisions in our personal lives and in the life of our church family, as we seek to serve others and be a part of ministry and mission in our local community, that our minds would be set on the things of God. That we would see life, the decisions that we have to make, the challenges and trials that we face. That we would see these things with God's perspective, guided by his word and his spirit. Maybe we could pray that for each other. Maybe for those in your your home group, those who you sit with in committee or in Kirk session, those who sit around you on a Sunday morning. Pray that we might set our minds on the things of God and therefore see life with God's perspective. And that perspective includes what we find in these closing verses of the chapter from verse 24. Let me remind you of them because this is the way of life that every disciple of Jesus is called to as they follow in his footsteps. Let me read to you from Matthew 16 beginning at verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Accepting a suffering king on a cross is not only about trusting something which is at odds with the norms of our society, but it also means walking in the footsteps of the one that we trust. It means as a a disciple denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following him. It means accepting the call that as we walk closely with Jesus, that it will mean sacrifice and suffering. This is not the trials and hardships that are common to life in a broken world. As one commentator says, a cross comes from specifically walking in Christ's steps, embracing his life. It might mean facing scorn from others because we have sought to be faithful in following Jesus. And maybe that's in our workplaces, the call to be honest, not being prepared to cut corners despite peer pressure. It might be in our social lives, standing up against the crowd in face of the belittling of others. Or it could be a difficulty that can come from embracing the narrow way of the cross, that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And this is in a world in which truth is whatever anyone believes themselves. We can face sacrifice when we personally put ourselves out, when we experience cost to show the love of Christ to others. And we can know and feel the contempt of others when we embrace weakness instead of power. When we give up our rights, for the good of others, when we don't conform to the social norms as we seek to be faithful to Jesus. Putting aside the difficulties and trials of life that anyone might face, do you and I, through our dedication to Christ, experience taking up our cross? Do we experience living in a place of sacrifice and suffering for Christ's sake? This is what we are called to in faithfully following Jesus. But not only that. We are to die to self, to be a loser, to become a keeper. We are naturally selfish. I am naturally selfish. If we are honest with ourselves, we think about ourselves first 99% of the time. Immediately, I think of how I might be inconvenienced by this or by that. Or how the change of circumstances will affect my perfectly laid out plans. We can so easily and so quickly think of how we might benefit in a situation. Dying to self. Losing rather than keeping. They don't come naturally. But they do come from the work of God's spirit in our lives. Changing us to become more like Jesus. In salvation terms. We should be so, so thankful that Jesus isn't like us. That he didn't think of himself first, but instead set aside his rights to claim kingship and honour and instead suffered on a cross to save us. Unlike what I think we would do, he looked beyond the pain and humiliation of the cross and instead focused on his Father's glory and his love for you and I. And so me dying to self, me giving up the right to be boss of my life, me handing over control to Jesus, me living for Jesus in every way. Well, these things are hardly sacrifice when we compare it to what we find in Jesus. Because we find a God who welcomes us into his family, a saviour who loves us and wants the very best for us, a Holy Spirit who will never leave us. We find security, assurance, companionship, hope, peace, eternal life and abundant life in the present. Our souls are saved for eternity in the perfection of heaven, which is much, much, much more to offer us 
than 2021 ever could. Today in embracing a suffering king, we are also called to embrace his lifestyle of sacrifice. And it's only through losing our lives for him in the present that we can begin to experience a foretaste of heaven through the close presence of his spirit with every step that we make. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood. Thank you again for joining with us online this week. As I've said before, please do get in touch. If there's anything that I can be of assistance with, just lift the phone. I would love to hear from you. But as we part, can I pray for you? Let us pray. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, 
to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And God bless. There is a name that reigns without contention whose power can't be questioned or contained With humble faith He rules the earth and heaven His glory knows no measure or refrain He's bursting past the borderlands of space Throned upon the praises of our hearts Jesus, you're the King and you're the center of